Hi guys, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on classical mechanics and relativity. I'm Dr Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be discussing Hamiltonian mechanics. Many of you may already know the concept of the Hamiltonian from the context of quantum mechanics, but of course Hamiltonian mechanics was not developed for quantum mechanics, but rather for classical mechanics, and that's what we're going to look at in this lecture. We start with the Legendre transformation of the Lagrangian to devise the, uh, the Hamiltonian. This basically affects uh, a transformation of the independent variables of the system from the generalized coordinates and velocities to the canonical coordinates, which parameterize phase space. These are basically the generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta. Once we've done this, we'll be able to derive Hamilton's equations of motion. These are first order differential equations and are basically a counterpart to the second order Lagrangian uh, Euler Lagrange equation of motion. So this is a different way of doing the mechanics, and we'll have a look in this lecture at some of the situations where this description uh, makes uh, more sense and is more easy to implement in practice. In particular, that happens when we have lots of conserved quantities. Of course, also, this formulation which we'll develop here is naturally uh, generalizable and extensible to quantum mechanics, which is where it's uh, probably become more famous since then. We will look at some kind of coordinate transformations which are time dependent, for example, into a rotating frame of reference. We'll also look at some transformations uh, which are time independent and yield a so-called scleronomic system. In those cases, and provided that we have a potential energy, um, which is something which only depends on generalized coordinates and not on the generalized velocities, we will see that the Hamiltonian has a direct physical interpretation as the total energy of the system. However, if we have a non-scleronomic system, which has a time dependence, or if we have a potential that is not derivable from a force in the usual way, and, uh, and therefore is not a potential energy, we'll see the Hamiltonian, although it exists, might not be interpretable as a total energy. We'll also look at the conditions for which the Hamiltonian is conserved or not conserved, and we'll see that this is actually independent of whether or not it can be interpreted as an energy. Finally, we'll look at the most general kind of uh, Legendre transformation to derive the Hamiltonian, uh, which is the case of a non-scleronomic system, for example, a transformation to a rotating uh, coordinate frame of reference. We'll be doing plenty of examples in this lecture, so let's get down to work. So in this lecture, we'll be talking about Hamiltonian mechanics. Therefore, we'll consider explicitly the transformation from the Lagrangian here, which is a function of the generalized coordinates and generalized velocities, to the Hamiltonian, which is a function of the generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta. Together, the generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta are referred to as the canonical coordinates. The transformation from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian is called the Legendre transformation. The Legendre transformation works by switching the independent variables from the generalized coordinates and velocities to the canonical coordinates. One can imagine that this would be possible in general by considering that the generalized momenta, the pi, are actually related to the generalized velocities through the Lagrangian as partial dl by dqi dot. And here we have the concept of the implicit inverse. We can basically say that the generalized velocities, the qi dots, can be written in terms of the generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta. We can write down the expression for the generalized momenta and then invert this expression to find the generalized velocities. I say that this is an implicit inverse because we don't actually have to do this it's sufficient to know that such an inverse exists in principle. If we did have the explicit expression for the qi dots, the generalized velocities, then we could go into our uh, expressions, all of our equations of motion, and just eliminate all of the generalized velocities, and then we'd only be left with the generalized coordinates and the generalized momentum. And that expression is precisely the Hamiltonian. So what's the point in this, and why should we bother? Well, basically, the Hamiltonian is written in terms of these canonical variables, the positions and the momenta, and these are the variables that define phase space. These obey the Poisson bracket relations, which we'll be discussing later on in this lecture. Hamiltonian mechanics 
treats the generalized positions and momenta on an equal footing. If we have n generalized coordinates, Hamiltonian mechanics yields 2n first order differential equations. And in those equations, we therefore need 2n initial conditions. Let's contrast this to Lagrangian mechanics. For a system of n degrees of freedom, we have n second order differential equations, but we still, of course, need 2n boundary conditions. In the Hamiltonian formulation, conserved quantities reduce the complexity, and this is actually unlike the situation in the Lagrangian formulation. Again, we'll return to explicit examples of this during this lecture. And finally, um, Hamiltonian mechanics generalizes rather nicely to other areas of physics, in particular to quantum mechanics. You will probably have heard of the Hamiltonian more familiarly uh, in the context of quantum mechanics than classical mechanics, and that's not because uh, Hamiltonian mechanics was invented for quantum mechanics. Indeed, it was invented by Hamilton in the 1800s exactly to treat classical systems. It's just that it's in a very powerful and general framework that allows us to generalize it nicely to quantum mechanics. So let's look a little more deeply now at the Legendre transformation. So as we saw from the first few lectures, the Hamiltonian is defined from the Lagrangian via the Legendre transformation, and it is defined as follows. We imagine that the Hamiltonian h, which is a function of the generalized coordinates q, the generalized momenta p, and in principle time t, is given in terms of the sum of the products of the generalized velocities and the generalized momenta minus the Lagrangian itself, which is a function of the generalized coordinates, the generalized velocities, and in principle also time. So we can see from this expression that the Hamiltonian always exists. If we have a Lagrangian, we can always find the Hamiltonian. However, as we'll see in this lecture, the Hamiltonian is not necessarily always equal to the total energy. So let's now use this uh, definition of the Hamiltonian from the Legendre transformation to derive Hamilton's equations of motion. First of all, we'll note that the Hamiltonian is a function of the canonical coordinates. H is a function of the QIs, the PIs, and T. So I can say that H is a function H of all the QIs, the PIs, and T. And this means that I can write down an infinitesimal dH, which must be related to infinitesimal increments along the independent variables. So I would say that dH must be equal to some amount along the qi direction, plus some amount along the pi direction, and to some amount along the time coordinate. The magnitude of each is, is exactly the partial derivative dH by dqi, dH by dpi, and dH by dt. And of course, we have multiple generalized coordinates qi. So in general here, I would have a sum over the generalized coordinates i of these terms. And dt is a bit special, that's just on its own. So this is basically just the expression for the total derivative dh in terms of its uh, independent variables, the qi's, the pi's, and t. We can play a similar kind of trick by analyzing the Legendre transformation directly. There, we can say that dh from the expression for the Legendre transformation must be the sum over i of a small increment of the qi dot pi minus a small increment in l. So let's analyze this first term. We've got d qi dot pi, and so we can expand that simply by using product rule. And for each generalized coordinate i, we would have d qi dot pi plus qi dot d pi, and then of course minus dl. Well, what about dl? Well, L 
is, of course, a function of the generalized coordinates, the generalized velocities and time. So we can play exactly the same game and say that dl is the sum over the generalized coordinates i of partial dl by dqi, dqi plus partial dl by dqi dot, dqi dot plus partial dl by dt, dt. And so we can substitute that into this expression. But before we do, maybe we just recognize a few interesting features in here. First of all, we have this quantity dl by dqi. From the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion, we know that dl by dqi is actually equal to pi dot. Furthermore, we have a term in here, dl by dqi dot, and that is actually just the definition of pi. And so something very convenient and clever has happened here, because when we subtract off dl, we have a piece that's pi dot dqi, and we have a piece which is pi dqi dot. This piece, the latter piece, pi dqi dot, exactly cancels with this term from uh, the definition of dh here. And that will actually eliminate the dependency on the uh, dqi dot, meaning the independent variable along the velocity direction. And that's exactly what we wanted to do, and that's the purpose of Legendre transformation. So by plugging this expression for dl into here, we'll obtain the following. And this is very nice because now we have two expressions for dh. We have this expression and this expression, which we obtained in different ways, and we can see that they both depend on dpi, dqi, and dt. It's worthwhile pausing here a moment to understand what we did with this Legendre transformation. We were able to change the functional dependence of the Lagrangian from the generalized coordinates and velocities to the Hamiltonian, which depends on the generalized coordinates and momentum. So the functional dependence has changed. However, the resulting expression here that we have for dh actually still involves these generalized velocities. It doesn't involve dqi dot, so it's not an independent variable, but it can involve the parameter corresponding to qi dot, which is simply a number, which is the velocity at any given point. So the proper Hamiltonian h is obtained by taking Legendre transformation and eliminating all of the remaining qi dots. I will show you how to do that with specific examples later. The important point about the genre transformation is that it switches the independent variables from q and q dot to q and p. We still have to eliminate the qi dots from the resulting expression. Okay, so let's now turn to a comparison of our two different expressions here for dh. In fact, we can compare these expressions term by term. We can compare the coefficients of dpi, dqi, and dt separately, and this will yield Hamilton's equations. In particular, when we compare the dqi coefficients, we obtain that dh by dqi is equal to minus pi dot. This is the first of Hamilton's equations. When we compare the coefficients of dpi, we see that dh by dpi is equal to qi dot, and this is the second of Hamilton's equations. And finally, although sometimes forgotten, we see if we compare the coefficients of dt, we have that partial dh by dt is equal simply to minus partial dl by dt. So the time dependence of the Hamiltonian is actually equal up to this minus sign to the time dependence of the Lagrangian. So here they are written again. Let's try to understand what is written here. So first of all, this top equation, dh by dqi is minus pi dot. This is basically providing standard Newtonian dynamics equivalent to Newton's second law. This is because we're uh, on the right hand side here, we see that we have the rate of change of the momentum of course, this is the generalized momentum, 
and it's related to, rather than simply the force, on the left-hand side here we have the partial derivative dh by dqi, the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the generalized coordinates. But the fact that we have the rate of change of the momentum on the right-hand side is basically why we make the analogy to Newton's second law here. The second of Hamilton's equations is basically inverting the definition of the generalized momentum. So usually we'd say that pi is equal to partial dl by dqi dot. The generalized momentum is related to the generalized velocities. Here in Hamilton's equations, we have it the other way around. We have the generalized velocities being related to the generalized momentum. Um, the generalized momenta are defined in terms of the generalized velocities by taking derivatives of the Lagrangian. But when we obtain the generalized velocities from the generalized momenta, we take derivatives of the Hamiltonian. This last expression here basically tells us that if there is no explicit time dependence in Lagrangian, then there is also none in Hamiltonian. So Hamilton's equations describe the dynamics of the canonical coordinates pi and qi. It tells you how these things evolve in time. This first expression tells you what is the rate of change of the generalized momentum. The second expression tells you what is the rate of change of the generalized coordinates. It's telling you about the rate of change of the canonical coordinates, and hence their dynamics. Specifically, if we know the Hamiltonian h, we can find p dot and q dot. Then if we integrate these, then we can find the phase space trajectories, namely the q of t and the p of t. The phase space trajectories basically tell you everything you need to know about the system. So what we see here is that the Hamiltonian really describes the dynamics of the system. It determines the trajectory in phase space of our system. Often the Hamiltonian is equated with being just simply the energy of the system. Actually, it's far more than that. It determines the dynamics of the system. And furthermore, as we'll see, um, the Hamiltonian is not necessarily always equal to the energy, but the Hamiltonian always exists and it always determines the dynamics as I've shown you here. Let's now turn to the conservation of the Hamiltonian. What do I mean by that? Well, let's repeat the expression for the total derivative dh from the previous slide. We can write that as the sum over all of the generalized coordinates of qi dot dpi minus pi dot dqi minus dl by dt times dt. That's just the expression that we derived on the previous slide. If you want to talk about the conservation of the Hamiltonian, we need to know the time dependence of the Hamiltonian, namely dh by dt. So what I can do is take this expression and simply divide it by dt. Okay, this is not exactly mathematically rigorous, uh, but the result I'll show you from this uh, shortcut cheat here is actually the correct result. So you can take my word for it that this is a legitimate operation. I will simply divide all of these infinitesimals by dt. And what will I obtain? Well, this last term here is dt by dt. That's just equal to one. What about these other things? Well, obviously I have dpi by dt. That's pi dot. I have dqi by dt. That's qi dot. And so something rather amazing happens, which is that this combination here ends up being qi dot pi dot minus pi dot qi dot, that whole term is equal to zero. So overall, I have that dh by dt, the total derivative of the Hamiltonian respect to time, is equal to minus partial dl by dt. But from Hamilton's equations, we know that minus dl by dt is partial dh by dt. And so I learn that the total derivative dh by dt is actually equal to the partial derivative dh by dt. So this might seem like a rather confusing or weird equation, 
what does it mean when we have the total derivative equal to the partial derivative? Well, on the left-hand side, the total derivative tells us about the entire time dependence. This is the explicit time dependence and the implicit time dependence. So this is what we mean when we say the time dependence of the Hamiltonian. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, partial dh by dt refers only to the explicit time dependence. What do I mean by the explicit time dependence? What I mean there is that we have an expression for the Hamiltonian, h equals something or other, and that that Hamiltonian, h, has explicitly the time parameter in the equation. It means that I can take uh, the partial derivative of that expression with respect to t and come out with something finite. So for example, I might have a term in the Hamiltonian that's cos omega t or something like that. It does not refer to all of the implicit time dependences. For example, we know that the generalized coordinates qi um, have an implicit time dependence. The qi's change with time. But those qi's, although they might feature in the Hamiltonian, do not have an explicit time dependence. We don't see the parameter t appearing explicitly in the expression. All of this will be made crystal clear when I give uh, an example in a few minutes. But first of all, let me just say that this expression, the, the total time dependence of the Hamiltonian is equal to the uh, explicit time dependence, has an important consequence. It tells us that if the Hamiltonian is conserved, meaning dh by dt is equal to zero, therefore the Hamiltonian is not changing with time, it means that there is no explicit time dependence. It means that the parameter t just does not appear in either the Hamiltonian or, of course, the Lagrangian. So what does it mean if the Hamiltonian is conserved? Well, if the Hamiltonian is conserved, it means that h is a constant and doesn't change with time. And this happens when we have a closed system. A closed system is one that is not coupled to any kind of environment. On the other hand, if the Hamiltonian is not conserved, it means that h is not a constant. It's something that changes in time. And then we have an open system. An open system is one where the system is itself coupled to some kind of environment. The environment has an external effect on the system. It could be a force system or a driven system, or the energy in the system could be dissipated to the environment. An open system is therefore not an isolated system. In such a case, the Hamiltonian will have an explicit time dependence, and therefore dh by dt will not be equal to zero. So now I want to convince you that this expression, that the total derivative dh by dt is equal to the partial derivative dh by dt, is actually a deeply non-trivial result. And we're going to do that by an example, a very simple example, of the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. This is basically a mass on a spring. So in this example of the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, we imagine, for example, a spring with a spring constant k and a mass on the end of that spring, a mass m, uh, which can be displaced from the equilibrium position by an amount x. First of all, let's write down the Lagrangian for this system. We're getting good at this by now. We should just be able to write this down. It's the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. The kinetic energy is a half mv squared. This is a one-dimensional system, so it's simply a half m x dot squared minus the potential. And for a spring, we use Hooke's law, which is simply minus one half of k x squared. Very good. Let's now derive, using the Legendre transformation, the Hamiltonian. We have a system of one degree of freedom. So the Legendre transformation is simply the generalized uh, velocity times the generalized momentum minus the Lagrangian. 
So here we actually have to work out Px. We do that from the Lagrangian dl by dx dot, and it's simply the regular linear momentum m x dot in this particular case. And so going back to our Legendre transformation, we have m x dot squared minus the Lagrangian, which is a half m x dot squared minus a half k x squared. And so overall, we end up with one half of m x dot squared plus one half of k x squared, which interestingly, and this is a, a point we'll return to later, is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, or the total energy, E. So in this particular case, we see that the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy, and furthermore, we've derived an expression for it. But actually, we're not quite done yet, because here we've derived the Hamiltonian using the Legendre transformation, but our resulting expression here actually still contains the generalized velocities. The Hamiltonian should properly be a function of the generalized coordinates and momenta, and therefore we need to express our Hamiltonian somehow in terms of x and px rather than x and x dot. Now in this case it's pretty straightforward because we have an expression here for px just in terms of x dot. So I can simply write a half mx squared as px squared over 2m using this expression for px is equal to mx dot, this is exactly the same, plus one half of kx squared, and I've therefore been able to write my Hamiltonian purely in terms of the canonical coordinates x and px. Okay, so let's now continue to use Hamilton's equations of motion, and this will allow us to work out the dynamics of the system. In particular, let's start off with Hamilton's equation dh by dpx is equal to x dot. This is very easy because on the left-hand side we have dh by dpx and we have our Hamiltonian in terms of px. This is exactly why we needed to perform the previous step of eliminating the generalized velocities here and writing the Hamiltonian in terms of px. It's because to use Hamilton's equations, we need to be able to take partial derivatives with respect to px. So with this expression in hand, we can now very simply work out uh, the left-hand side dh by dpx, which is clearly simply px over m. In turn, rearranging this equation, we have that px is equal to m x dot. So this is actually exactly the expression that we started with over here, that px is equal to m x dot. This is why I said on the previous slides that this uh, one of Hamilton's equations is basically like an inversion of our definition of the canonical momentum. The Newtonian dynamics, however, will give us something else and something interesting, and that is contained in the other uh, of Hamilton's equations of motion, dh by dx, and that's equal to minus px dot. Remember here that we have this additional minus sign. On the left-hand side, dh by dx, this is something, again, that we can easily compute for this system. It's just simply, in this case, kx. So you see here that I have two first-order differential equations, one for the time derivative of the generalized coordinate x and one for the time derivative of the generalized momentum px, and these are actually coupled together. So px is giving x dot and x is giving px dot these equations are intertwined, so we have to solve them simultaneously. Actually, there's a fairly easy way of doing that in this case. We can simply take the time derivative of this first expression here on both sides, which will give us that mx double dot now is equal to px dot, and we have an expression for px dot. It's simply minus kx. So you see this is really equal to Newton's second law 
for the mass on the spring. Alternatively, I could have taken the time derivative of this expression and substituted in this one. This gives us a slightly different formulation, which would simply give us that px double dot is equal to minus kx dot, which is minus k over m of px. So we actually see an alternative formulation here of Newton's second law. This is the usual one, mx double dot is minus kx, but we can equivalently write this as px double dot is minus k upon x of px. Either of those equations can be obtained from the Hamiltonian formulation, and we can solve them to obtain the phase space trajectories. How do we do that? Well, these are just second order differential equations which we can solve in the regular way. Actually, they're very simple ones, and therefore I'll just write down the solutions. We have these general solutions here with uh, constants a and b, which are determined by the initial conditions. They are basically the two constants of integration, which we obtain either by solving the second order differential equation, or equivalently, these two coupled first order differential equations. So let's now return to the original question on the explicit versus implicit time dependence of our Hamiltonian. So here we have a Hamiltonian. It's px squared upon 2m plus a half kx squared. And we've actually now already gone to the trouble of solving Hamilton's equations to work out the phase space trajectories, namely x of t and px of t. We see in these expressions, x of t and px of t, an explicit time dependence. Specifically, we see here that there is a sine omega t and a cos omega t, respectively, in the canonical coordinates x and p. So obviously the particle is moving. We have a dynamical system. We have a mass at the end of the spring, and this mass is bobbing backwards and forwards. The position is constantly changing, and the momentum of that particle is constantly changing. So can we see from these expressions that the Hamiltonian is conserved? If the Hamiltonian is conserved, then h should be a constant. But it's not exactly easy to see this from the expression. In the expression for h, we have something involving p squared and something involving x squared, and both p and x depend on time in some uh, complicated way. If h is to be a constant, it must be that these terms conspire with each other so that overall uh, the time dependence drops out. So let's just check that that is indeed actually the case. The first term is 1 over 2m of p squared, which is a m omega of cos omega t plus b, all squared, plus 1 half of k x squared, which is a sine of omega t plus b, all squared. So let's tidy this up a bit. The first term would become one half of a squared m omega squared cos squared of omega t plus b. The second term is one half of k a squared sine squared of omega t plus b. So we see here some expression that has uh, a time dependence now because we actually substituted in x of t and p x of t into the Hamiltonian. And we see that it's not actually completely obvious that the Hamiltonian is a constant. To be able to understand that, we actually need to use the specific condition which comes out of the solution that omega is root k upon m. When we plug that in, in particular here, we'll see that omega squared will be k upon m, uh, and that first term here will therefore be converted into one half a squared k. And of course, that's exactly the same as in this second term here, one half a squared k. Uh, we can take that out as a common factor, then we're left with cos squared plus sine squared, which as a trigonometric identity is equal to 1. Overall, therefore, we find that the Hamiltonian is a constant, and that constant is specifically 1 half of k a squared. Therefore, indeed, dh by dt is equal to 0.
To really prove that dh by dt is equal to zero, we have to fully solve for the entirety of the dynamics. We have to substitute x of t and px of t back into the Hamiltonian, and we have to um, rearrange it and tidy it up and use some trigonometric identities. And then finally, we see that h is a constant. That's the brute force method. Of course, Hamilton's equations give us immediately the shortcut. Hamilton's equations tell us that dh by dt is actually just equal to the partial derivative, partial dh by dt. And that's extremely easy because we simply go to our expression for the Hamiltonian and we see, is there a parameter t floating around in an expression somewhere? And the answer is no. I don't see t explicitly written anywhere here. And therefore, partial dh by dt is equal to zero in this case. And therefore, the total derivative dh by dt is equal to zero. And that's what we went to great lengths to establish by the brute force method here. So this is uh, illustrating here the difference between the explicit and the implicit time dependence. This system does have an implicit time dependence through x and p, but the Hamiltonian itself has no explicit time dependence, and therefore by Hamilton's equations, no implicit time dependence. This is actually a very, very helpful expression here to determine whether or not the Hamiltonian is a constant. So why would we be interested in whether or not the Hamiltonian is conserved? Well, that has something to do with the conservation of energy, and we'll be returning to that rather shortly. Before we do that, though, let's turn to some other conserved quantities that we can see directly from Hamilton's equations. Let's restate Hamilton's equations again here. We have that dh by dpi is equal to qi dot. We also have that dh by dqi is equal to minus pi dot. So from these expressions, we actually immediately learn the conditions for conservation laws in this problem. Let's take this expression, dh by dqi is equal to minus pi dot. If dh by dqi is equal to zero, then pi dot is equal to zero, and therefore pi is equal to a constant. It is something that doesn't change with time. It is a conserved quantity. Of course, this is exactly what we learned from the Lagrangian formulation. We saw that if the Lagrangian does not depend on uh, a generalized coordinate qi, then the coordinate qi is said to be cyclic, and the corresponding generalized momentum pi is conserved. So we see this is exactly the same in Hamiltonian formulation. If the Hamiltonian does not depend explicitly on a parameter qi, then the corresponding generalized momentum pi is conserved. It's a constant. It does not change with time. So for Hamiltonian mechanics, we see something that's very, very similar to the concept of cyclic coordinates and conserved quantities in Lagrangian mechanics that we explored in a previous lecture. However, in Hamiltonian mechanics, we see additional possibilities, which makes this framework somewhat more powerful. Specifically, from here, we see that if dh by dpi is equal to zero, then obviously qi dot is equal to zero, and therefore qi itself is a constant. So we see from this uh, expression of Hamilton's equations directly that if the Hamiltonian does not depend explicitly on the parameter pi, then the corresponding generalized coordinate qi is constant. It's something that is actually a conserved quantity throughout the motion. So we can have a kind of sense of cyclic coordinates and cyclic momenta. If the Hamiltonian does not depend on the generalized coordinate qi, it is cyclic and the corresponding momentum is conserved. If the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on the generalized momentum pi, then we have a cyclic momenta and the corresponding coordinate qi is conserved. So for each conserved quantity, the first order differential equation involving that object is actually trivial. So either the pi or the qi that's conserved is just set by the initial conditions and then doesn't change after that. 
it's set by the initial conditions, and then it's constant, it's conserved. Therefore, the complexity of the problem is actually reduced by having these conserved quantities. If we have n degrees of freedom and m conserved quantities, then in the end, we'll only have 2n minus m equations to solve. Note that this is not the case in the Lagrangian framework. If we have a cyclic coordinate, such that dl by dqi is equal to zero, then of course we know that pi dot is equal to zero, and therefore pi itself is constant, it's conserved. But qi dot still appears in the Lagrangian, and hence the Lagrange equations of motion. We actually still need to solve n second order differential equations. So we see a difference between the Lagrangian formulation and the Hamilton formulation here. Despite having conserved quantities in the Lagrangian formulation, we have to still solve n second order differential equations. Whereas in the Hamiltonian formulation, you have to solve 2n minus m first order differential equations, where m is the number of conserved quantities. So really the complexity is reduced by the conserved quantities in the Hamiltonian formulation, but it's not that simple in the Lagrangian formulation. So in this sense, the Hamiltonian method is clearly better and more suited to dealing with conservation laws than the Lagrangian formulation. Before turning to the connection between the Hamiltonian and the energy, let's do another simple example. We'll step up the complexity slightly here to illustrate the points I've been mentioning on this slide to the two-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator. It's still a very, very simple system, but it is one which we can use to illustrate some of these points. So this is the Lagrangian for the two-dimensional harmonic oscillator, we have um, a kinetic term, which is basically one half of the mass times the velocity squared, minus a potential term, which is one half times a spring constant, essentially k, times r squared. So here we have a position vector, r vector, which is actually just in two dimensions. This is a two dimensional harmonic oscillator. So our r vector is just x and y, and our corresponding velocity our vector dot is just the vector x dot y dot. Okay, so we're actually going to convert this to different sets of generalized coordinates. We're going to pick generalized coordinates that respect the circular symmetry of this problem. So in particular, we're going to use plane polar coordinates. Our generalized coordinates q will be r and phi in the plane, which are defined such that x is simply r cos phi and y is r sine phi. This gives rise to generalized velocities. x dot is equal to r dot cos phi minus r phi dot sine phi. Remember, we have to use product rule here. And likewise, y dot is r dot sine phi plus r phi dot cos phi. Good. So with these expressions at hand, we can now recast our Lagrangian in terms of our generalized coordinates. It's 1 half m r dot squared. This is not an r vector dot squared here, but literally r dot squared, plus one half of m r squared phi dot squared minus one half of k r squared. Notice here that I uh, exploited the trigonometric identity that cos squared plus sine squared of eddy angle is equal to one. So, um, in going from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates, we see the emergence of this uh, centripetal term here. Good, so that's Lagrangian. What about the Hamiltonian? Well, we obtain the Hamiltonian by Legendre transformation. How do we do that? Well, 
Legendre transformation is defined as the sum over the generalized coordinates of pi times qi dot minus the Lagrangian. In this case, it means pr r dot plus p phi times phi dot minus the Lagrangian. which I'll write out again. And what remains to be done now is to work out PR and P phi, but we can do that rather straightforwardly from the expression from the Lagrangian, because we know that PR is partial dl by dr dot, which in this case is very straightforward. It's just m r dot, and p phi is partial d l by d phi dot, which likewise is just m r squared phi dot. Very simple. So something rather fortuitous appears to happen, because here we have m r dot times another r dot is m r dot squared, and here we have minus half of m r dot squared. And the same thing actually happens for the phi term. So overall, we see that the uh, Hamiltonian h is given by a half m r dot squared plus a half m r squared phi dot squared plus a half k r squared which is actually equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, which is the total energy. So again, fortuitously, in this case, we see that the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy. Surely this can't be by accident that this comes out like this every time. Well, we'll see shortly the ex exact conditions when it happens and the caveats and counterexamples when it doesn't happen. OK, so here we have a Hamiltonian that still contains the generalized velocities r dot and phi dot. And as we know, the Hamiltonian should only contain the canonical coordinates, which are the generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta. So we wish to eliminate the r dot and the phi dot from this expression. How do we do that? Well, we can do it by basically inverting these expressions for the canonical momentum which are written in terms of r dot and phi dot, in terms respectively of pr and p phi. So finally, we can write our Hamiltonian in terms of our canonical coordinates, and we obtain pr squared upon 2m plus p phi squared upon 2mr squared plus one half of k r squared. So this is the final correct form of the Hamiltonian because not only have we performed the Legendre transformation um, to eliminate the functional dependence on the velocities, but we've actually also then gone through the expression and eliminated explicitly the r dot and the phi dot terms and written the Hamiltonian just in terms of r and phi and pr and p phi. It's extremely important that we eliminate the, uh, the velocities, the r dot and the phi dot, when casting our Hamiltonian. Why is that? Because we want to use Hamilton's equations of motion. And Hamilton's equations of motion involve partial derivatives of h with respect to the canonical coordinates, which are the generalized uh, coordinates and the generalized momenta. So we cannot have these generalized velocities floating around in there because they are not actually independent from the generalized um, momenta. We can see them from these expressions here. So we really need to eliminate those generalized velocities if we're going to go ahead and use Hamilton's equations of motion. Of course, another thing immediately leaps out at us, which is that although PR and P phi feature are features, but phi does not itself feature, that is, of course, because phi is a cyclic coordinate, and that tells us that p phi, although it appears here in the Hamiltonian, is actually a constant. So let's see how that all works out when we use Hamilton's equations.
Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian written out again. Let's look at Hamilton's equations of motion now. We have partial dH by dPr, we know is equal to r dot, according to Hamilton's equations. What is partial dH by dPr in this case? It's extremely simple. It's just PR over M. What about dH by dP phi? We know that that is equal to phi dot. And likewise, we can take the uh, partial derivative of h with respect to p phi. It's again very straightforward. It's simply p phi upon this time m r squared. The other of Hamilton's equations involves the generalized coordinates. We can express partial dh by dr as minus pr dot. And in this case, dh by dr is simply kr minus p phi squared upon m r cubed. And finally, we have dh by d phi, which is equal to minus p phi. But our Hamiltonian does not contain phi explicitly, therefore partial dh by d phi is actually equal to zero. In turn, this tells us that p phi is equal to a constant. That constant is determined by the initial conditions, and then p phi remains fixed and unchanging throughout the motion. So according to Hamilton's formulation, the fact that we have a cyclic coordinate immediately tells us that p phi is equal to a constant, and we've reduced the complexity of our problem by one, because we now only have three of these differential equations to solve. How does that help us in practice? Well, we can see here that if p phi is equal to a constant, then I can substitute it onto the right-hand side of this expression, and then I'm just left with phi dot is some constant over mr squared. And likewise, in this expression, I can substitute p phi as a constant up here, and then I will have an expression for pr dot just in terms of the variable r on the right-hand side. Again, we eliminate the, uh, the p phi from this expression by replacing it with some constant. So we had four coupled first-order differential equations, but the fact that we have a conserved quantity here means this gets reduced by one, and now we only have three equations to solve. In practice, this basically means that we can solve these top two equations here simultaneously to find an expression for r of t, and then once we have that, we simply plug that into this final expression down here to obtain the, uh, the phi of t. Let me be a bit more concrete. Let's say this expression is number one, this is number two, and this is number three. Then from expression number one, we can take the time derivative of both sides to express r double dot as pr dot over m. And then into this, we can substitute expression number two to obtain that r double dot is actually equal to minus k upon m of r plus p phi squared over m squared r cubed. And here we have to remember, of course, that p phi is itself actually just a constant. So this latter expression here is a second order differential equation, just in terms of the r coordinate, which we can solve. Once we have that, we can plug it back in to equation one to obtain p r. And we can also plug it in to equation number three to obtain phi dot. In this way, we can completely solve for r of t and phi of t, and p r of t, and p phi, which in this case, of course, is just a constant. Okay, so now I want to go back to this question of the relation between the Hamiltonian and the energy of a system. So first, let's consider the general expression for the kinetic energy of a system. For a system of n particles, we have to sum over each of those particles, and I'll label them i equals 1, 2, 3, and so on, all the way up to m, 
and then we take a half mv squared, in this case a half mi, the mass of particle number i, times uh, ri vector dot squared. This gives us the total kinetic energy of a system of n particles. It can also be expressed in its Cartesian coordinates by summing over particles i of a half mi, and then here I'll explicitly write xi dot squared plus yi dot squared plus zi dot squared. And this is the velocity components along the x, y, and z directions respectively. So you can see here that for a system of n particles, we have three n uh, Cartesian coordinates. So let me write this last sum here in a slightly different way. So here I've introduced this second sum over alpha, which runs over the x, y, and z components of the r vector or r dot vector of a given particle i. So here I implicitly assume that I have a vector ri locating the position in Cartesian coordinates of particle i. It can be given as x, y, z, but here I'm also specifying that in this more general language of saying r x i, r y i, and r z i is the x, y, and z components of r i for the particle, and the corresponding velocities are simply the time derivatives of those things. I want to set it up in this rather more general way so that I can now switch to generalized coordinates qj. These generalized coordinates qj, I will have 3n minus c of these things, where n is the number of particles, we're working in three-dimensional space, and then here I have c subscript h, here denoting the number of holonomic constraints. So as discussed in a previous lecture, if we have holonomic constraints in the system, that actually reduces the effective number of degrees of freedom that we have to work with. And therefore, when we switch to our uh, generalized coordinates, we can take the constraints automatically into consideration just by a proper choice of those generalized coordinates. So we start off with Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z for each of our particles. We clearly from this expression have uh, 3n of those objects. Um, but if we switch now to some arbitrary generalized coordinates, we can actually take into account these holonomic constraints just through the choice of our coordinates. So here, j runs from 1 all the way up to 3n minus c sub h. Good. So what we now want to do is perform a change of variables from the original r alpha i's to these generalized coordinates, the qj's. What does that mean? It basically means that we can write the r alpha i original coordinates as a function of the new coordinates, meaning q1, q2, q3, and so on, all the way up to 3n minus c. And in principle, we could have a time-dependent coordinate transformation so I can allow this transformation between the R's and the Q's to also depend on time. We'll discuss that in a moment shortly. Okay, so with this functional dependence spelled out, we can now play the usual game of working out the total derivative dr alpha i and express this in terms of an infinitesimal along each of the independent variable directions, meaning dq1, dq2, and so on. So we write that d r alpha i is now simply a sum over generalized coordinates j of partial d r alpha i by dq j and then total differential dq j. Um, time is slightly different so I write this one separately like so. Okay, so this is the usual expression. Now I can uh, do the, the trick of dividing this by dt to obtain uh, dr alpha i by dt, which is otherwise known as r alpha i dot 
This is going to be the sum over generalized coordinates j, dr alpha i by dq j, and then dqj by dt, otherwise known as qj dot. And then finally, we have dr alpha i by dt, partial derivatives, and the dt's cancel. So this is a, a nice generalized way of expressing the original uh, velocities, the r alpha i dots, in terms of our generalized coordinates. And you can see here explicitly the uh, generalized velocities coming in, as well as these other factors. And we'll be exploring the role of those other factors shortly. Now, what we need to actually compute the kinetic energy in here is the r alpha i dot squareds. So we actually need to take this entire expression here and square it. And this is the expression we get when we do that. Here, we just have to be careful because in our expression for r alpha i dot, we have a sum over j. So when we square this, we can't use the same label j twice. So this is why I end up with this double sum here over j and k, and then I get two factors of these derivatives. That's basically to allow for all of the cross terms that I get when I multiply this sum uh, by itself. But I also get cross terms involving this and this. This is this second term here. And then finally, this last piece squared. So I actually get all of these kind of pieces when I compute the r alpha i dot squareds. OK, so what has this taught us? So we see directly from this expression that the original kinetic energy in Cartesian coordinates is strictly quadratic in those Cartesian velocity components. That's the r alpha i dot. So we see only in this original expression the r alpha i dot squareds. When we convert to generalized coordinates, q, uh, j, we see a term that is also quadratic in the generalized velocities, meaning we see a term q, j dot, q, k dot. However, we also see some other terms in here that are only linear in the generalized velocities, and indeed terms that don't depend on the generalized velocities at all. So the structure of this kinetic energy looks a little bit different, actually, when we go to generalized coordinates. There's a special limit where things become more similar, and that is when we don't have a time-dependent coordinate transformation. This is a so-called scleronomic system. So if the coordinate transformation is not time-dependent, then I can write explicitly that dr alpha i by dt is equal to zero. When I express my r alpha i's in terms of the generalized coordinates, that coordinate transformation does not depend explicitly on time, and therefore I have this uh, condition here. And when we have that, this is referred to, as I mentioned, as a scleronomic system. It's one where the coordinate transformation does not depend on time. So, for example, if we switch from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates, that would be a regular kind of uh, point coordinate transformation, and it would not be something that involved time. Therefore, that would be a scleronomic uh, transformation, and we'd end up with a scleronomic system. On the other hand, if we converted to a rotating frame of reference, then this would be a time-dependent transformation, and we would not have a scleronomic system. So what does this imply? Well, basically, if we have a scleronomic system, then our kinetic energy becomes strictly quadratic in the generalized velocities. That actually follows directly from this condition that partial dr alpha i by dt is equal to zero. If we were to substitute this scleronomic condition into this expression here, we would see that this second term vanishes because it contains this factor, and this third term vanishes because it contains the factor twice. That then just leaves us with this first factor. And if we were to now substitute this first factor into our expression for t and compare it to this expression, then we can now read off the t j k parameter that I've introduced here. And we'll see that t j k is actually equal to t k j. The order of those uh, indices doesn't actually matter. And it's simply given by one half of the sum 
over I and alpha of the mass of particle I times these quantities dr alpha I by d q j times dr alpha I by d q k. And you can see here why um, the order of the indices jk and kj doesn't matter because it just involves uh, the product of these two terms and I can multiply these in either order and I get the same answer because these are simply scalar objects. So the punchline of all of this is that if I have a time-independent coordinate transformation, I have a so-called scleronomic system, then I can express the kinetic energy in this strictly quadratic form where these parameters here, um, which are the coefficients of the term uh, qj dot qk dot um, are simply given by this expression. So from now on I'll hide all of this uh, complexity to do with the coordinate transformation uh, behind this object uh, t j k and I won't talk again explicitly about this. So it's going to be taken as read that the coordinate transformation has been parameterized by this object t j k. And what I'm left with is this rather simple quadratic form for the full kinetic energy T. So what we have here is a completely generalized expression in the special case that we have a, uh, a time-dependent coordinate transformation. Although this is a special case, it's of course a very, very common case, and that's why we're discussing it here. Later on, I'll return to the time-dependent non-scleronomic case. So let's now analyze the quadratic form of the kinetic energy that I've presented here. What we will now do is actually work out the Hamiltonian for this system, which we can do now in generalized coordinates through the Legendre transformation. In preparation for that, let's calculate a specific, maybe cryptic looking object. Let's look at the partial derivative of the, the full kinetic energy dt by dql dot. So I'm picking a particular generalized velocity, QL dot, and I'm taking the derivative of the full kinetic energy with respect to that. We'll see why this is an important object very shortly. So with the definition at hand of our kinetic energy in terms of these generalized coordinates, I can then express this as the sum over J of T J L of q j dot plus the sum over k of t l k of q k dot. And that is because if I imagine taking the derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to a specific um, generalized velocity q l dot, then I have to go to my expression here and I have to say, okay, whereabouts in this expression does a q l dot arise? And it actually arises in two places. It arises once um, when j is equal to l in this sum, and it arises once when k is equal to l in this sum. And when I have that term, then I can uh, simply take the derivative with respect to the ql dot. But since here tjk is equal to tkj, um, these two sums are actually completely equivalent. That's because here I'm summing over j, and that's basically just a dummy index. I can call that any letter I like. Here I chose to call it k, j, but I could equally have decided to call it k. If I had called it k, and then I'd swapped the order of l and k in here using this, uh, this relation, then we would see that these two terms are actually equal. Have a think about that yourself to make sure you agree. But the upshot of all of that is that this whole expression becomes twice the sum over now a single sum over just j of t j l times the corresponding generalized velocity q j dot. Okay, so this looks like a somewhat uh, abstract quantity, but we'll see that it's actually very important. Why? Let's compute something that actually looks even more abstract. Let's look at the sum over L of QL dot times DT by DQL dot. 
Now, we've just worked out dt by dq l dot, and so I can substitute that in. And this will give me now twice the sum over both j and l when I substitute that in of t j l times q l dot from the original expression and then q j dot from the substitution. And that object is definitionally exactly twice the full kinetic energy. So this was a rather circuitous way of showing that if I use this uh, strange object here, um, that actually is equal to two times the original kinetic energy. This object is actually the thing that appears in our Legendre transformation. So that's where all of this was going. The Legendre transformation takes us from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian. I have Hamiltonian H, which in terms of our generalized coordinates, let's label them L, is simply the generalized velocities multiplied by the generalized momenta. But the generalized momenta are, of course, dL by dQ L dot and then minus Lagrangian. So just to remind you, these objects here are the PLs, the generalized momenta. So if I have a Lagrangian, which is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, and if the potential energy V is only a function of the generalized coordinates and not the generalized velocities, then this implies something very important. It means that when I calculate PL, which is partial DL by DQL dot, this is actually equivalent to partial DT by DQL dot. And that's simply because the potential energy does not depend on the generalized velocities. So therefore, when I take the partial derivative of v with respect to q dot, I get zero. So in this expression for Legendre transformation, I have these generalized momenta coming in here, but that's actually equal to partial dt by dq l dot, provided I have a potential energy which doesn't depend on the velocities, which is the usual scenario. This is the usual condition that we have. OK, so now we can actually go ahead and work out the Hamiltonian using the Legendre transformation. We see that h is equal to the sum upon l of q l dot now times partial dt by dq l dot minus the Lagrangian which is t minus v. And what do we obtain? Well, we went to great lengths earlier to show that this first expression here is actually equal to twice the kinetic energy. And so magically, we have the final result that it's 2t minus t plus v. And therefore, the Hamiltonian is simply the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy which is, of course, the total energy. So within this completely generalized structure, without reference to any specific system or any specific transformation to generalized coordinates indeed, taking into account even constraints, we've been able to show that the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy. Importantly, though, we also saw from this derivation the conditions when this applies. We see explicitly that the Hamiltonian is only equal to the total energy when we have a scleronomic transformation. The kinetic energy has to be quadratic in the generalized velocities. That's coming from the fact that the coordinate transformation is time independent. Furthermore, we see that the potential must be a potential energy. It's something that doesn't depend on the generalized velocities. If both of these conditions apply, then indeed the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy.
So there's a couple of important things to note at this stage. One is that the Hamiltonian always exists. We can always obtain it from the Lagrangian for a given system through Legendre transformation. However, the Hamiltonian is not necessarily equal to the total energy. Whether or not it does actually depends on the coordinate system chosen. And secondly, I want to emphasize that the Hamiltonian may or may not be conserved. Whether or not H is a conserved quantity that is constant and doesn't vary in time is determined according to whether or not dH by dt is equal to partial dH by dt, and therefore whether or not the Hamiltonian has in it an explicit time dependence. But this, this uh, condition here is actually independent of whether or not the Hamiltonian is equal to the energy. So to summarize here, we can have situations where the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy and it's conserved, or we can have situations where the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy, but it's not conserved. For example, if we have a dissipative system, one with friction or something like this. On the other hand, we can also have situations where the Hamiltonian is not equal to the total energy, but is conserved, or one where the Hamiltonian is not equal to the total energy, and it is also not conserved. So all of these possibilities can arise. So far, we've focused mainly on the Legendre transformation to obtain the Hamiltonian in the case of a scleronomic system, where the transformation to our generalized coordinates does not explicitly depend on time. What I want to do now is consider a generalized Legendre transformation uh, for non-scleronomic systems. So this will be a totally general formulation in which we also allow our uh, generalized coordinates to depend on time. So first of all, let's consider a Lagrangian of the following form. So here I'm letting the Lagrangian be some L0, and here specifically I'm assuming that L0 is a function only of the generalized coordinates and time, and not the generalized velocities, and I incorporate all the remaining velocity dependence into the remaining two terms. One is going to be linear in the generalized velocities, and one is going to be quadratic in the generalized velocities. This latter term here is the one we were discussing on the previous slides. It's the term that arises when we have a scleronomic system, and the kinetic energy is parameterized completely in terms of these uh, bilinears involving the generalized velocities. However, we saw that in general, we also get a linear piece and a constant piece. The constant has been in here absorbed into L0, um, but L0 will not depend on generalized velocities, so the linear term in the velocities will be accounted for by this piece. These aj's here and tjk's are, uh, are arbitrary constants in this expression. So this uh, form of Lagrangian basically covers most conceivable situations you could imagine, um, including electromagnetism with its velocity-dependent potentials. So basically all of the velocity-independent parts um, are contained in L0, and all of the velocity-dependent parts are contained here in the linear and quadratic pieces. Obviously, we could imagine an even more complicated system with higher-order terms in the Lagrangian, um, which were cubic or higher in velocities, um, but uh, there are not many physical situations one can, one can imagine where uh, we, we write those down. Certainly, none of the microscopic laws of nature uh, follow that. And so this is a very good starting point as a general kind of Lagrangian for what follows. Okay, so to perform this very general kind of Legendre transformation, I will introduce some convenient notation. Here, let's let a vector q be a vector of the generalized coordinates. I mean q1, q2, q3, and so on. Um, I will let the vector a be a vector of these coefficients here in this middle term, these aj's. So again, this will be a1, a2, a3, and so on. And as you can see from the second term, there are as many a's as there are q's, and so these vectors are of the same dimension. Finally, we have a matrix T, which I'll denote with a hat here, which is a matrix 
of the coefficients t, j, k featuring in the expansion of the kinetic energy there. And obviously, I would have t11, t12, t13, and so on. t11, t21, t31, and so on. t22, and so on. So this is a matrix of those matrix elements, the t, j, k's. So with that uh, in mind, and also, of course, q vector dot just means d by dt of q vector, I can express my Lagrangian in an extremely compact way. I can write it as L0 plus the dot product of the a vector with the q dot vector, that accounts for the middle term, and then here, q dot t q vector dot accounts for the quadratic term. So this expression is, with these definitions, is mathematically equivalent to our starting Lagrangian. Very good. Uh, now let's compute the generalized momentum. A given generalized momentum, pj, is given from the Lagrangian as partial dl by dqj dot. And that gives us aj plus twice the sum over k of tjk into the qk dots. This is very similar to the calculation we did on the previous slide. I can therefore make a vector of the generalized momenta, which I'll call P vector, which just means P1, P2, P3, and so on. And I can just read that off from this expression. It's clearly the A vector plus twice of the kinetic energy matrix Uh, with the kinetic, uh, with the generalized velocity q vector dot. So if I were to compute this matrix product here, I would precisely obtain this term. This term here is exactly the definition of this matrix product. So you see this is rather convenient because I'm able to express all of the quantities in terms of these vectors and matrices. Furthermore, I can actually obtain the generalized velocities, the q vector dots, in terms of the p's, just by using the usual machinery of matrix algebra. In particular, inverting this expression gives me, gives me that q vector dot is simply equal to one half of the inverse matrix T into P minus A. So this is nice because we just use the usual machinery of matrix algebra to do the inversion for us, and we get the entire vector of the generalized velocities for free. Okay, so what's the point in all of this? Well, we set out to do a generalized Legendre transformation. This gives us an expression for the Hamiltonian H in terms of the Lagrangian, and we can express the Legendre transformation in terms of these vectors, again, very concisely as p vector dotted into the q vector dot minus l. With all of the definitions that I have, I can now write that very simply as p vector dot q vector dot minus l naught and then minus a dot q vector dot minus q vector dot t q vector dot. But this is not quite the eventual form of the Hamiltonian, because when we're forming the Hamiltonian, we're supposed to eliminate all of the dependencies on the generalized velocities and write everything just in terms of the generalized momenta. But here we're in a nice position to be able to do that because we have explicitly inverted this expression for the generalized velocities in terms of the generalized momentum. So when I plug this in, I can write the Hamiltonian 
just in terms of the generalized momenta, and I would obtain in that case the following expression. So this is the final form, and it's a completely general way of expressing the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of the things that feature in the Lagrangian, namely the A vector and the T matrix. This is also completely general in the sense that it works also for non-scleronomic systems. Here we are allowed to have a completely general form of the initial Lagrangian, including um, the linear terms in the velocity, which arise when we have a time-dependent transformation from our Cartesian coordinates to our generalized coordinates. Basically, for any Lagrangian, we just have to write down the matrix T, invert it, and then we obtain this expression. So let's now put all of this into action and do an example. And the example I will choose, uh, which will have a few teachable moments, will be a spring with a mass at the end, and the whole thing is being dragged along by a cart. So schematically, something like this. So imagine that we have a cart moving along in the positive x direction, and it's moving along with a constant uh, velocity v0. Attached to this cart will be a spring. Let's attach it here in the middle of the cart, and we imagine that there's a spring. And at the end of that spring is going to be attached a mass m. So obviously this mass is also moving along, but it can also be bobbing backwards and forwards because it's attached at the end of the spring. Okay, so let's define an origin of our coordinate system. Let's say there's a wall here, and that is x equals naught. We can therefore label on a few important uh, points on this diagram. Let's say the position at any given moment of the mass m will be a distance x away from our reference point. We'll say that the spring is of length x primed. And we'll say that the distance of uh, the, uh, the connection points, if you like, of the spring to the cart uh, which will be x plus x primed. This is something that's being moved along uh, with the cart. Let's say that this total distance here, the distance travelled by the cart, is d. That will be equal to v naught times t. The cart is moving along with a fixed velocity uh, v naught in the positive x direction. And let's say at time t equals naught, it was at uh, the origin of our coordinate system x equals naught. So from the diagram, we can immediately read off that x plus x primed is equal to v naught t. Let's say that the spring has a natural unextended length of x primed naught. Therefore, the extension of the spring will be x primed minus x primed naught. And therefore, the potential energy of the spring, by Hooke's law, V, is equal to 1 half K, the spring constant, times the spring extension squared, which is simply X primed minus X primed naught squared. Now, let's use a generalized coordinate to describe everything in this system, which is going to be simply the x coordinate here, the position of the mass m. I can actually write x primed in terms of x because I know they're connected by the distance traveled by the cart d, which is itself some something we know as a function of time, v naught t. So the system really comprises just one particle in one dimension. We have one degree of freedom. The cart and the spring don't count here. The cart is not really a dynamical object because we know it just has a fixed speed, and the only role of the spring is to exert a force on the mass. Therefore, if I write everything in terms of my generalized coordinate, I can write this as 1 half k into v naught t minus x minus x naught primed squared.
And remember here, importantly, that k, v0, and x0 primed are all simply constants. Okay, so to form the Lagrangian, we of course also need to know the kinetic energy. We only have one uh, effective particle in the system, it's the mass at the end of the spring, and so I can write the kinetic energy here as a half m x dot squared. So we're in a position to write down the Lagrangian t minus v, and we have a system here which has a kinetic energy that is strictly quadratic in the generalized velocities, and we also have a potential that is really a potential energy that doesn't depend on the generalized velocities. So these are the conditions that we need um, to actually simply write down the Hamiltonian as the total energy T plus V. So in this calculation, I'm actually not going to do Legendre transformation to find the Hamiltonian. I don't need to do that, provided I verify that the kinetic energy is quadratic in the generalized velocities and that the potential is independent of the generalized velocities, then I can simply write down the Hamiltonian as t plus v. I should, however, remember that I uh, need to write this in terms of the generalized momentum. So let's, while we're about it, simply write down px, which is partial dl by dx dot. And in this case, this is simply m x dot, the regular linear momentum. But with that in mind, I can write down the Hamiltonian in a very simple way. I simply get px squared over 2m for the uh, kinetic energy term. And then for the potential, I add that on a half k of v naught t minus x minus x naught primed, all squared. So this is the correct form of the Hamiltonian here in our canonical coordinates x and px. Okay, so what can we do with this information? Um, a first important question is, is the Hamiltonian conserved? For that matter, is the energy conserved? So how do we go about answering these questions? Well, we can use um, the important relation that we derived earlier in this lecture, that the time derivative, the total time derivative of the Ham Hamiltonian is actually simply equal to the partial derivative dh by dt. And in this case, we see that this is non-zero. That is because our Hamiltonian explicitly contains the parameter t. And that itself is arising from the fact that we have some uh, moving object in, the, uh, in our Lagrangian here that is, in a sense, beyond the description of the system itself. To take account of that, when we calculate partial dh by dt, uh, we do find, in fact, that this is non-zero. Explicitly, we get this to be k times v0 into v0 t minus x minus x0 primed. So this is not zero. We have an explicit time dependence of the Lagrangian and of the Hamiltonian, and therefore the Hamiltonian is not conserved. On the other hand, the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy. We know that because the kinetic energy is strictly quadratic in the generalized velocities, and the potential is a potential energy that's independent of the generalized velocities. So here we have a scenario where the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy, but the energy is not conserved. Why is the energy of this system not conserved? Well, it's basically because our definition of the system is a little bit too narrow. If we expanded our view and said that the system comprised both the mass at the end of the spring and also the cart, then the total energy would, of course, be conserved. However, our system is missing the cart degrees of freedom. The system energy varies with time. It takes a force, and hence energy ex is expended, to keep the car moving at a constant speed v0 against the spring forces by Newton's third law. So the fact that the mass is bobbing up and down due to the spring extension exerts a force on the mass, but by Newton's third law, it also exerts a force on the cart 
this force would cause the cart to accelerate unless there was also a force being applied to the cart to keep it moving at a constant velocity v0. So there are actually forces that are missing from our uh, description here to keep the cart moving at a constant v0 against the spring forces. So there's a whole part of this uh, energy equation here that we're missing out by focusing just on the mass. That's why when we look at our restricted system of the mass bobbing backwards and forwards, we see time dependence, we see that the Hamiltonian is equal to the energy, but that energy is not conserved. Part of it is dissipated into the card system. So let's take another look at this problem, but this time we'll adopt a different perspective. Let's imagine that we're walking along the positive x direction also with a velocity v0. This means that we adopt a co-moving inertial reference frame with the cart. What will the physics look like in this reference frame? To achieve this, we'll perform a standard Galilean transformation of our coordinates to this co-moving frame of reference. And we do that by saying, let some new variable y equals v0 t minus the old variable x. Using this transformation, we can now just substitute into our old expression for the Lagrangian and find out uh, what the Lagrangian looks like in terms of our parameter y rather than our parameter x. So what does the Lagrangian in terms of the new coordinate y look like? So this is the expression we obtain. In the original Lagrangian, we had a kinetic energy, a half mx dot squared, and therefore when we take the time derivative of this expression, we can express that in terms of a half m v0 minus y dot, all squared. The potential energy piece involves the extension of the spring, and this reduces simply to a half k into y minus the natural length of the spring, x0 primed squared. So let me expand this out. What we see here is that the kinetic energy term is not strictly quadratic in the generalized velocities. We have a term a half m y dot squared, as we would like to see, but we also see a piece that's linear in the generalized velocity, minus m v naught y dot. Also coming from this term is an arbitrary constant. Um, I'm actually going to ignore this in what follows, because as we know, constants in the Lagrangian do not affect the dynamics. We still have this uh, same piece coming from the potential energy as before, but the fact that the kinetic energy piece is not strictly quadratic in the generalized velocities has an important implication. It means that the Hamiltonian cannot be equal to the total energy from our earlier analysis. It also means that we can't just write down h equals t plus v for this system. We actually have to do the full Legendre transformation to obtain the Hamiltonian. So let's go ahead and work out the Hamiltonian using the Legendre transformation. We can write down that the Hamiltonian is equal to y dot py minus the Lagrangian. Here we have to work out the uh, canonical momentum py from our Lagrangian. We do that by simply writing partial dl by dy dot, which gives us my dot minus m v naught. So when we plug this into our expression for the Hamiltonian, we get m y dot squared um, minus m v naught y dot minus the Lagrangian. Here, I'll uh, ignore this final constant piece here. That doesn't really matter. OK, so let's tidy up some of those terms and see what we get. Uh, first of all, we can compare this m y dot squared with a half m y dot squared here to obtain 1 half m y dot squared. But this term here, minus m v naught y dot, 
actually cancels completely with the analogous term in here. So this is actually different from the case when we have a uh, Hamiltonian that's equal to the total energy. So that term cancels, and then we're just left with plus one half of k into y minus x naught primed squared. So we can see directly here that the Hamiltonian is not equal to t plus v. It's not therefore equal to the total energy. So when we're in the co-moving frame of reference, the Hamiltonian is not giving the energy of the system. However, the Hamiltonian is conserved. And we can see that directly because dH by dt is equal to partial dH by dt. And there is not a time parameter featuring explicitly in this expression. So if I were to take the, uh, the partial derivative of h with respect to t, there is no t in this expression. Therefore, that right-hand side is equal to 0. So we see, therefore, that h is a constant and doesn't change in time when we adopt the co-moving frame of reference. However, in this frame of reference, the Hamiltonian, this thing that is conserved, does not actually represent the energy of the system. So in this example, we adopted two different reference frames. We adopted the static reference frame, uh, in which case we saw that the Hamiltonian was equal to the total energy, but it wasn't conserved. And then we adopted the co-moving frame of reference, in which the Hamiltonian is conserved, but it doesn't represent the total energy. So these are some of the kinds of things that can happen when we're looking at Hamiltonian mechanics. So in this lecture, we considered a number of things. We looked at generalized uh, Legendre transformations. We looked at doing this in a time-independent way as well as a time-dependent way. We looked at the relationship between the Hamiltonian and the total energy, and we looked at when those things are conserved. In the next lecture, we're going to expand upon this framework a bit and look at the concept of phase space and phase space trajectories, we're going to look at canonical transformations, which involve mixing up both the generalized coordinates and the uh, generalized momenta. We're going to look at Poisson bracket relations and the time dependence of observables and all of that good stuff that we can get from the Hamiltonian formulation.